same kind of principles that, that existed at the international level existed at the local and regional levels in terms of trusteeships. Uh, so I'd like to elucidate that a bit. Um, the expertise in trusteeships is really being developed at local levels. And at the international level, it's not so well understood. The law of the sea treaty has been a pretty much a big failure because we didn't know how to manage the seabeds back in the 1970s and 80s when that was developed, and we still don't know now. That's a global, supposedly it was going to be a trust. It's not a trust yet, but hopefully it will still be moved in that direction. The tradition at the local levels comes from common law, which predated civil law. So once the commons started to become captured and closed over the period of you know, the last five, six hundred years, seven hundred years, um, civil law began to supplant common law. And at least we have the ability to reach back into natural law and affiliate that with common law because that was what was understood centuries ago. And we can refer back to that as legal precedent. We may not be able to stand on it completely because we have to make it relevant for today and we have to re-justify it, but at least we have a precedent for it. At the international level, there is no such precedent. By the time the international system merged and came together, states had already declared civil law as their national law, their sovereign law. And when they came together for international treaties, they still used the basis of civil law to create those treaties. And that's what we have today. So that's one of the different, big, major differences between local commons and global commons. There is no common heritage tradition at the global level. We are going to have to create that. That's actually a handicap, but it's also not just a challenge that we can't handle. It's a challenge that's in our hearts to make happen. That's my sense. It really is the task of us in the 21st century to make that happen, to create trusteeships that are local, <clears throat> modeled on the expertise that's really being developed at the local levels. And in my career, I've worked at the international level, I've worked at local levels, and I've tried to bridge the gap between the two. This is why I, I see that the, 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 this is a possibility of making this scale free. And you reduce the, pro the scale problems of, of moving from ownership to trusteeship. And my, my guarantee that this will happen is all the good people who are managing trust very successfully at the local levels. And what does it mean to, to uh, put a trust together? How does that it, it happen? Should it be state managed? Should it be completely community managed? Um, are there hybrids? What's legitimate? Well, you know, the, the, every resource is different, and therefore the management of it is going to be different. Every culture around the world is, has variety and difference. And so there's no one model that really works because it's going to be a bit diverse from place to place. And the launching into this new era of trusteeships is going to be wrought with confusion. That's why some people in the comments movement are trying to bring epistemological um, rigor to the discussion, as well as policy rigor to the discussion, because we really got to get on the same page, because the cultural and the resource differences between uh, these uh, different areas of the world kinds of commons, plus the fact that some are depleted and some are replenishable commons, means that there are 
United States has triumphed once again, right in our grassroots, even below our grassroots, hundreds of feet below the ground. We've done it. And it's, it's the Yankee can't do spirit, all that crap. <laughs> so, so this is a big problem that is that we're going to have to address. And the, the fact is that is that the enclosures are getting more and more micro. When Harvard University can, can patent genes and patent an element, it, created, it found an element that hadn't been discovered before that patented it. As though they can do something like that. And they've done, they've done it. Monsanto patented seeds, and this goes on and on. How, how, can we, how can we turn this back? How can we roll back those enclosures? That's part of the problem. And how is this mobilized? How can we implement this when, in fact, we're facing a moving target because the marginalization of the commons is getting more and more intense all of the time. They're figuring out clever new ways to encroach upon the commons that they can privatize and generate profit from. And uh, we've watched it happen right from the beginning of the enclosure movement in the UK hundreds of years ago, right to the present. It's been one continuous history of the same kind of proposition. The private sector, supported by the state, in closing the commons. Stakeholders in that region have to get together and declare that something's wrong. This situation can't stand. Aren't these resources, or weren't these resources by our ancestors utilized by them? Didn't they have a claim to the resources as commoners? That, that they were able to live and thrive and sustain themselves from these particular resources. Now, you know, the, the corporations will come in and buy a resource, take it outside the community and produce it and sell it back to the people who live there. Yeah. That's exactly what's happening. And the problem is, is this empowered us. We've become cynical about the process, and we say, what can we do? There's no, there's no solution. Well, there is a solution. It's not to rely on the local governments and the state governments to provide the solutions, because if you go there for the solutions, it's never going to happen. You can go there and try to get math and your, your own local solutions ratified, and that's important. We're going to have to do that. We're going to have to do that through, through the trusteeships. The trusteeships have to become legal entities, and they have to be fiduciary institutions. So we have to manage these as businesses. At the same time, it has a different incentive in business. It has to be, it has to be a business that is number one. The bottom line of this business has to be preservation of this resource in perpetuity, long term. That's the reason why we have this trust, to, to guarantee the sustainability of that particular resource. Because businesses were not created to do that, and governments are not created to do that. They have no interest in long-term preservation of resources. They can pretend that they do, but, but they won't, and they can't. It's not why they were created. It's not why national constitutions are enshrined to protect the interests of private property. Government has no other function to protect private property. We can fool ourselves and say, well, what about the social welfare state and the social dividends? That's not the primary purpose of government, it's to protect private property. We can't fool ourselves any longer that that's the case. The fact is that what we've got to do is before we get to the level of trust, we have to come together as stakeholders in the community and all the other interests in the multi-stakeholder area come together and have dialogue. Come together and say, what are our rights? What are the, what's the history of this resource? How did it get captured? What are the responsibilities of resource managers in this uh, community? Um, who are other potential stakeholders that we can involve in this process? How long will this process take? Where is this process going? Can we, can, can we appoint leaders? If we appoint leaders, then they call out the process. How much can we make this a plural process? How much can, how much can we afford to make this the maximum of polycentric decision making, horizontal decision making? Occupy people are saying, calling it. How, how can we guarantee maximum subsidiarity that local people will really be making the decisions? Is that possible? Because we've been trained over generations to think that it's not possible because those rights were taken away from us when the, all the properties were enclosed long ago and they continue to be the whole. We're, um, we've become 
recognizes that the, the nation is going to have to follow a new kind of policy, which is a interest-free currency rather than debt-free currency, or a debt-based currency, debt-driven currency. Then things change completely. And it's the commons itself that provides the basis for that debt-free currency. It's the commons itself that provides the assets that can actually make that monetary system work. And the people who have the assets are at the local levels. The unification of global awareness around this has to be spread far and wide. People have to create citizens' organizations and a widespread global consciousness. 20 years ago, you would have said, that's crazy. Today, you could say, well, that's crazy, but at least we have the internet. <laughs> at least we're talking to each other globally. At least there are global citizens' groups and there are more NGOs than been created over the last you know, five to ten years that we can absolutely imagine. There are millions, there are literally more than a million NGOs in the world today. So uh, the problem with civil society today is they're not trusteeships, they're ownerships, at least for most of them. You think about a civil society organization in most cases, it's reifying the ownership system. That's why it's not a viable third sector it's a de facto third sector which has adopted uh, the policies of the state and, and, and the market, and at least the state and the market for funding, which is why it doesn't challenge national constitutions and the enshrinement of the national constitutions of private property. The essence of people working on commons is that producers and the users of resources are effectively the same people. That's that's the transformation that we that we see on the commons. So, so that's what links traditional commons and trusteeships around the traditional commons with the new emerging digital commons, because the users are becoming the producers of their own resources. This is a major revolution because it eliminates the division of labor, but it does more than that. It makes people empowered to recognize that that they, that they don't own the resources. Are we going to be able to manage global resources in the same way? 
economy between carbon tax and capital trade, we'd be talking about common space solutions that involve the atmosphere. And um, it, it's, it's the expertise from civil society that really has to step up and, and begin to see themselves as trusteeships rather than supporting the interests of ownership. That's why the people that in, in the trusts that are operating right now in the local commons have a lot to teach civil society because civil society has to come to that recognition at some, some point. If we can create a political movement of labor, the geoists, Georgists, uh, the uh, commons movement, um, all the people working with the traditional transition towns, the great transition, the power and the paradigm shift people, and uh, you know, a, a greater trend, a greater coalition of all those people has to has to take place, and it's got to be, in my view, it's got to be based on the vision of trustees.